I'd like to start off by noting that we'll be going on island speed. I'm in no rush. I hope you are not in a rush either. I am grateful for all those who are physically attending. It's a joy to share some of the pains, some of the sorrows that have come with my racialized experiences. And I'm uh, especially grateful too for those who are watching virtually. Um, I know that you have many things that you could be doing and so I'm grateful that you are giving this mestizo part of your hour. Thank you, too, for those that are going to be watching the recording later on. Uh, again, I know that there are many things happening, and I am grateful for all those that are willing to share some of their time to listen to the ways in which the Lord has been working in my life. I must give special thanks, special thanks, again, to uh, Dr. Laura Yoder. Uh, she has seen me taking baby steps to figure out how in the world to organize something like this event. Thank you for your kindness. A special shout out to Laura Atkinson of Hunger as well for helping to organize this event. And I have to give a, an enormous shout out to Amy Park, the office manager of the philosophy department who has kept me on the straight and narrow in a way that I did not think was possible. Thank you so much, Amy, for helping me to put on this event. Thank you too for my dear sister, mi hermana, uh, Dr. Kristen Ford for joining me. And lastly, I want to give a special thanks to the AIT and tech team. Uh, I know this is an evening in which in many respects you'd like to be home, but we are grateful for the ways in which you are making sure this runs smoothly. Thank you again to all the co-sponsors. Uh, it means much to me to have such support. And I want to note before I turn to the reading uh, that today is indeed Indigenous Peoples Day. And Wheaton College stands on the ancestral homeland of three nations, the Ojibwe, the Arawa, and the Potawatomi nations. As Latino with Taino ancestors, I am mindful of the importance of remembering indigenous peoples and their ancestral lands. Now, a few words about the two pieces that I'll be reading. They come as I have attempted over the, oh, 30 so years of my life to understand what it means to be a part of the Latino diaspora that comes from Puerto Rico. That is not all that I am, but that is an important part of who I am. It is important for me to reckon with the reality that Puerto Rico is plunder. Its inhabitants are the spoils of the US-Spanish War. It is indeed a people marked by Anglo imperial expansionist white supremacy. Of course, before that, there was Iberian white supremacy. But what is it to be a people that are deemed never white enough to really be part of the United States? To remain foreign, but in a domestic sense. That's what the insular cases have decided is the relationship that the United States has to Puerto Rico. You might hear that we are a commonwealth. The truth is we are a colony. We have taxation without representation. And uh, I, if you know anything about the US Revolutionary War, you would know that that would seem to be a thing that is not acceptable for the inhabitants of the United States. So what I will share with you are two readings, my efforts to come to grips with what it means to be a pilgrim on the way, who's not only a pilgrim in a certain spiritual, metaphorical sense, but a pilgrim whose people are a colonized people, a pilgrim who has had to deal with many forms of racialization coming at me and has been utterly baffled and confused. So two readings. The first is called Latinos and the Parish House. Latinos in the Parish House. And it is a presentation of what it was like for me one day in one summer to work with a lawn crew. The second reading is called, Don't Worry Mamma, I'm Black. This contains a fourfold racial schooling lesson. And so I highlight again, we'll have Latinos in the Parish House. There'll be a break, short break, and then I will read, Don't Worry Mamma, I'm Black, which is divided into four schooling lessons about my racialized experiences. If you are interested in reading these, you can find Latinos at the Parish House on my blog slash website. You can find more about that on my department webpage. And uh, Don't Worry, Mamma, I'm Black is published by World Outspoken, a group that is deeply committed to helping the church understand what it is like to be mestizo or mestiza. So we begin Latinos at the Parish House. It had been un dia Miserable, a miserable day. As usual, los jefes put me on cleanup duty. 
I was responsible for collecting and disposing all the yard waste our crew made while trimming every bush in a 20-acre townhouse community. More precisely, I had to keep up with three people who worked each minute as if their employment depended on it, because it did. As Victor, always practicing English, told me, we don't work hard, they fire us. There are a long line of guys who need jobs, and they work for cheaper. We have to work hard. No, como se dice, option. Mis amigos had gas-powered trimmers. I had a rake, tarp, and garbage can. Regardless, all had to work in extreme heat and humidity, and all started at 6.30 a.m. At 4.30 p as 4.30 p.m. approached, we were nearly done. None of my coworkers minded helping me clean up 30-minute old trimmings. I was behind. We were a team, something my superior working hermanos reminded me again and again, even when I worried that my relatively slow pace might jeopardize their jobs. And as we dumped the last can of trimmings into a truck bed, we saw Los Jefes and smiled. We could tell they were pleased with our work. Muy bien, Los Jefes said in unison, almost exhausting their Spanish vocabulary. You guys did good. A concerning smile stretched across their faces. You guys did so good, you have time for uno mas job. Go trim the bushes at the parish house. As Los Jefes jumped back into their air-conditioned truck, I got hot. Mis hermanos could tell, hey, Nathan, mira, it's no problem. We go, be done soon, no problem. Entiendes? See, si, I said, struggling to quell my growing rage. Yo entiendo. Exhausted and angry, I jumped in our truck and rolled down the window. Bushes served as fence lines separating the parish house from its neighbors, as if the yard were an endemic paradise, needing protection. Thankfully, the bushes weren't tall, but what they lacked in height, they made up in thorns. As I collected the trimmings, thorns pierced my glove-covered hands, my mestizo flesh. Each entry wound increased my longing to curse, though not like a northerner. I longed to cuss Southern style, to fill the air with Southern fixins Mamma uttered when she'd had enough. But I couldn't. Cussing like that on parish property could cost us our jobs. I couldn't risk it. Mis hermanos depended on me to be the Latino who spoke, quote, good English around our patrons. While biting my tongue and grateful we only had a few bushes left, I heard someone approach. What the fuck are you damn spicks doing here? I told them I hate spicks, and they sent you anyway? Startled, I stood at attention, fixing my eyes on the speaker, whose white collar reflected the sun. He continued, do you even have papers? I bet none of you stupid illegal bastards have papers. Tell your boss that the next time he sends you, I'm going to see if you have papers. I bet you idiots don't even understand a word I've said, do you? I understand you, sir, I said, enunciating each word with precision. Is there anything else you want us to share with the bosses? Our abuser turned red. He ceased looking at us and glanced at the ground. No, uh, no. Then he left without saying another word. We never got a benediction. Nathan, when her hermano asked, when it was just the Latinos, ¿Qué dijo él? Nada mucho, todo está bien. He knew I was lying. They all knew I was lying. But they also knew I was hurting. Try as I might, I couldn't stop the tears streaming down my face. Yes, the thorns hurt, but this pain was different. It emerged from a deeper, longer wound. Hey, Nathan, no problem. We finish. You go, go to the truck. It's okay. Everyone nodded, yet another act of mercy. Somos personas descartables. Somos los indeseables. Mis hermanos y yo, we were a team. That's Latinos at the parish house. 
Second reading, don't worry, Mama, I'm black. There are two epigraphal quotations. First is by Robin, excuse me, Rubin uh, Weston from his book, Racism in U.S. Imperialism. The racism which caused the regulation of the Negro to a status of inferiority was to be applied to the overseas possessions of the United States. Second quotation is from the uh, colonial scholar Homi Baba in his essay, The Other Question. The objective of colonial discourse is to construe the colonized as a population of degenerate types on the basis of racial origin in order to justify conquest and to establish systems of administration and instruction. Racial schooling lesson one. Like W.E.B. Du Bois, I learned I was a racial problem during school. But unlike Du Bois, my teacher, not a classmate, taught me this lesson. While frantically taking notes to ensure I succeeded in my first ever honors class, my sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Noon, rebuked me in front of the entire class for not paying attention. I remember her words. This is an honors class, Nathan, not a daycare center. Yes, ma'am, I know, but I was paying attention. Enough! You do not belong in this class, Nathan. Don't you understand? You are only here for racial diversity numbers. Mrs. Noon had racialized the entire class and found me wanting. I alone, as she would later tell my mom, did not have what it took to receive an honors education. I was Puerto Rican. I was inferior. Racial schooling lesson two. For reasons I cannot discuss here, my dad never taught me Spanish. And this gift was something he alone could give. For unlike my Anglo mom, my dad speaks fluent Spanish with an Aguadillan accent. Aguadilla is a town on the western side of Puerto Rico. My dad's omission haunted me throughout my childhood. It haunts me now. But it was during my childhood that other Latinos and Latinas most consistently distanced themselves from me. They refused to associate with self-identifying Latinos or Latinas who spoke Spanish as poorly as I did. As Augustine said, difference of language is enough to inhibit society. To most of my Latino Latina peers, I was adulterated Anglo trash, an unassimilated mongrel, a mutt to be shunned. I acutely felt my double racialized rejection in the weeks after Mrs. Noon denounced me before my honors English classmates. I had no racial home in the communal spaces Anglo and Iberian white supremacy forged. Whiteness, the racist reasoning goes, is pure. Those deemed non-white frequently counter by constructing and defending purist, essentialist logics to police their own communities. Blatant white supremacy begets whiteness of a different color. Policed by biological and linguistic racial border patrols, I felt damned to be peopleless. And as Mrs. Noon and Latinos and Latinas daily abused me, I started confiding more and more in my African American friends. They listened. They acted mercifully. They knew something of diaspora life, of being foreign but in a domestic sense. After several weeks of confiding in my friend Thomas, I decided to let it all out. Thomas. I don't know what I am. The Puerto Ricans and other Latinas and Latinos don't want me because my Spanish is shit. And the whites know I'm not one of them the moment a teacher botches my last name. What the hell am I? Thomas looked dumbfounded, but quickly replied, damn, Nate, it's obvious. You're black. Everybody knows that Puerto Ricans are black. What the hell are you so worried for? You're straight tripping not knowing your ass is black. I thought long and hard about Thomas's words and confidence. Could he be right? Was I black? I mean, come on, right? The suggestion seemed absurd. But as I kept thinking, I realized Thomas had a point. The Puerto Ricans and African Americans in my school and neighborhood always hung out. We wore similar clothes, liked the same English speaking music, found the same people attractive, and retrieved and received, excuse me, similar treatment from whites. Indeed, whites and non-Puerto Rican Latinas and Latinos had hurled the N-word at me countless times by this point in my life. With some Latinas and Latinos telling me the racist term like, racist terms like spick were too good for me. I decided to take a survey. 
I asked students across racialized lines if they thought I was black because I was Puerto Rican. The overwhelming majority said yes. This sealed the deal. These people thought I was black and usually treated me accordingly. It was time for me to live into my racial identity. It was time to belong. Racial schooling lesson three. My embracing being black caused enormous family strife. My Anglo mom did not understand it, and we repeatedly fought over my racial identity. Similarly, mi familia in Puerto Rico were flummoxed. For some, my embrace of being black proved I was a fool. It showed I did not understand the truths embedded in the Mojarrar la Raza rhetoric. Though this strife hurt, I pressed on. I was black and no one was going to persuade me otherwise. My blackness was too precious, too explanatory. I would not be peopleless, not again. But returning to the state, meaning the state in which I was born, not going back to being an infant, of my birth forced an unexpected racial reckoning. During a hot, humid day in South Carolina, Mama and I decided to go on a walk, and as was our custom, got lost in conversation, meandering around her childhood home. Eventually, the heat and humidity conspired and forced us to sit under a shade tree. Thirsty, Mama asked if I had water. I did not. But ever desiring to problem solve, I told Mama, Mama not to worry. I saw a gas station down the road and was happy to go and buy, some, buy us some water. Mama rejected my proposal. Honey, you can't go down there, she laughed. That's a black gas station. Here too, I had a solution. For though I lacked water, I had brought my blackness with me. Don't worry, Mama, I'm black. They'll let me buy water there, no problem. Mama became serious. I'd never seen such concern in her eyes. Honey, who told you you were black? I knew my answer mattered, so I, chose my I carefully chose my words. Mama, I'm Puerto Rican, and Puerto Ricans are black. The people in the gas station know this, and they'll let me shop with other black people. That's why I said I'd get the water. You stay here since you're not black. Mama was livid. Who the hell told you? my grandson, that you're black. I've never heard such stupidity my whole life. What a bunch of crack. Look here, I'm white, your mom is white, and your dad has light skin, light eyes, and speaks good English. He doesn't even have an accent. And now you're telling me that you're black. I don't know what they're teaching you up in the North, but down here we know you ain't black. And I'm not gonna let my grandbaby get beat to a pulp because he's some dumb delusion about being black. We're headed home, you hear? To her childhood home we went, in silence. A silence forged by what France Fanon calls an epidermal racial schema. Jim and Jane Crow had rendered Mama incapable of entering into my racial experiences and racial pain. Her socialization trained her to carry the white man's burden, not a racialized blanquitos. Besides, she had already fended off accusation that she sinfully let her daughter marry a black man. That would be my father. No northern racial schemes could dislodge her certainty about her family's whiteness. Racial schooling lesson four. Mrs. Noon's denouncement injected me with internalized racism that still courses through my body. So did my language-based rejection by Latinas and Latinos. Mi esposa can testify to the racial trauma that my body exudes when I publicly speak Spanish. Every utterance is an act of resistance that presses on racial scabs and renders me vulnerable to new racial wounds. Mamaw's rejection of my blackness forced me to confront racist fluidity. In the process, I learned from Rachel Moran that Puerto Ricans are the Latina, Latino group in the U.S., quote, most apt to identify themselves as black, close quote. And as they do, Douglas Macy and, and Nancy Disson, D, excuse me, Denton report, they experience higher degrees of segregation from whites, even white presidents. Recall President Richard Nixon's infamous campaign ad rehearsal in 1968. Having noted the need for school discipline, quote, 
Discipline in the classroom is essential if our children are to learn, close quote. Nixon goes off script, apparently speaking to himself. Yep, this is quote, yep, this hits it right on the nose. The thing about this whole teacher, it's all about law and order. The damn Negro Puerto Rican groups out there, close quote. The Negroes and Puerto Ricans are one racialized menace, a collective whose grouping lawlessly occupy classrooms and street corners. Mrs. Noon, my Latina Latino peers, and Mama, each identified me as a racial menace and a problem, and each resorted to disciplinary measures steeped in white supremacy to set me straight. None of their actions promoted intimacy or belonging. They never could. Racial reductions ultimately prove impotent. This impotence testifies to the need for race conscious formation that acknowledges the fluidity and complexity of racialization and the traumas it produces. Without such formation, teachers, families, and racialized communities will be ill-equipped to commune with the multiracialized among us. Thank you. Hello, friend. Hello. It's a gift to be here and to hear you read your own words. I think as I reflect on what you've just shared, I remember my experience first reading one of your pieces right before I went to sleep several months ago. It's a difficult piece to read before going to bed. And my experience is that I listen to you now. And I'm mindful as I sit here in this room as filled as we can be for COVID-19 with people, colleagues, and students, that I have a wide, wide, wide range of emotions. Mm. As I listen to what you've just shared, I have a wide range of experiences in my body as well as I listen to what you've just shared. And I'd like to start our time by, I guess, verbalizing something that you've given us permission to do, which is to be in the experience that we have as we listen. And to acknowledge that each of us hear Dr. Cartagena's story very differently. We experience it differently and we get to engage with it differently, but together. And my hope and prayer and invitation is that we will all be fully present here in this moment, both with Dr. Cartagena as a witness to his story, both past and present, as a witness to our own stories as we're forming them together in this moment online and here in this room. So before I share any other reflections that I have, Dr. Cartagena, I'm curious if you have anything you'd like to share about how you're doing as you sit down after sharing. Oh. Well, first, I'm, there's a part of me that's kind of glad I have the mask on, and there's a part of me that's <laughs> it's also upset that I have the mask on. Yes. Uh, yes, as you can tell, these pieces... They still bring tears because mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm thrust back into these moments that I've tried to sometimes unwittingly, sometimes wittingly bury. Mm -hmm. There are pains, there are evils I don't ever want to see, but part of my sanctification, part of my healing, part of my liberation, part of my redemption is confronting mm -hmm. and finding ways in which the Lord can still bring good out of, out of evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, one, the one thing I, I want to stress, I think, at the moment is you probably saw me most break down in Latinos at the parish house because there's something especially egregious about a priest asking if you have papers. Mm -hmm. Something especially egregious about a priest cursing you out, using the F-bomb, and doing so with the presumption that nobody in the entire area has a clue what he's saying. Mm -hmm. And I was very specific when I said, and we didn't receive a benediction, because this is one who is, as it were, a, an under shepherd of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's supposed to be uttering words of blessing to the people of God. And that is not what any of us on that crew, all of which identify as Christians, received. Mm. And that haunts me, because if I'm blunt, and this will be the last thing that I'll mention, okay. one of the reasons I had to write Latinos in the Parish House this summer it's because I've been dealing with decades of betrayal within the church. Mm. And time and again, they remind me of being in that 
Edenic place and seeing realities of the fall as it is now racialized, pressing against me, threatening to send these dear brothers who knows where, mm -hmm. even though all of them, by the way, always had their papers, always had their papers on them because they knew all it took was one person mm -hmm. suggesting that it was time for La Migra and they'd be gone. I was, I was mindful of my need to work well, not just for my income, but for their well-being, for their family's well-being. Many of them had family members in, in Mexico and in El Salvador, in Guatemala. And so they worked not just for themselves, but they worked for these family members elsewhere. And to hear a priest who didn't even take a few moments to figure out who we were, mm -hmm. what had the Lord been doing in our lives, curse us out like that, threaten deportation. Frankly, that is what has been coming back to my mind over and over again the past several months as I see across the United States, not only, but especially within the United States, an entrenchment mm -hmm. into forms of racism and white supremacy that I experienced my whole life. Mm -hmm. So I knew that this summer I had to work through betrayal. I had to work through betrayals like what I experienced at that parish house I'm happy to say more about that, but I think that that's another reason why that piece hits me so much, because though there has been some areas of improvement, mm. um, despite all that's happened in the past, say, eight months, there's so much entrenchment in the very sorts of things that I kept finding were hoisted at me while I was growing up. Yeah. I think I resonate with the depth of what you're sharing, because we're not just talking about the world out there. We're talking about the church and the church's complicity. And complicit is actually too, um, too narrow of a term. It's too tame. Mm. Mm. The church has become more than complicit. The church perpetuates. Yeah. In this case, it's the prime example of yeah. abuse, as you name so well mm. in the piece. As I was reflecting on your writings and also I love listening to you actually read your writings aloud because mm. you embody them and bring them to life. I'm, I'm reminded of how authentic you've been mm. in your pieces. I was talking to someone recently about how some people seem to tell stories in a more theatrical way. Mm. We had a robust conversation recently about how some people experience certain things as theatrical or other people experience it as a fully embodied way of being. And all of that is culturally dependent. If you come from a space or telling a story where you feel the feelings as you say them out loud, and it's obvious to the people around you, that's connected to your family culture or your ethnic culture or your friend group culture. Somewhere in here, one of the subcultures that you belong to has shaped whether or not it's acceptable to share so honestly. And what you've done, Dr. Cartagena, is to share both with your words, and you've been explicit in every sense of the word, <laughs> and direct, mm. but you've also shared with your nonverbals as well. Mm. As a clinical psychologist, that's something that matters greatly to me, is to see what we call congruence, mm. integrity, between the words that we speak and the way that we speak them. And integrity looks different for you than it might look for me, than it might look for any of you here. But for you, as your friend these last two years, I know that you've spoken with integrity, and that is liberating. Mm. Mm. I sat at my computer earlier and I was struck by the tears that came to my eyes as I read the words that I'd already read before mm -hmm. that I just heard you read again. And I thought about speed reading, not going on island time, as you said earlier, <laughs> just to get through again, kind of before coming downstairs. And I asked myself, Kristen, why are you speeding through your tears? Mm. Why is it that the pain that you experience as you listen to your friend's story mm. and the pain that it reminds you of in your own story, why is it that you need to get past that to get to redemption? Mm. And one of the things I've been sitting with the last few minutes is the reality that redemption only comes by acknowledging that something is horridly wrong yeah. first. Yeah. And that's what you've done. You've been so authentic in acknowledging that something, many things, are horridly wrong yeah. in the church, in our community, in these spaces. And before we can talk about the work of the Holy Spirit and bringing about redemption, 
in us as individuals and in us as a community. We get to acknowledge that authentically together. And I guess I'm curious if you would be willing to share as a first question in a moment, um, we'll get ready to go to Slido. I'm not sure if you guys know that we have Slido available for you all to post your own questions and your own thoughts about this, and I'll give that information in a moment. I'm gonna start by asking, though, if you would be willing to share a little bit more, not only about what's been going through your mind as you prepared this piece, but if you could share a little bit more holistically about what, how else it's impacted you to be in this space or to prepare the pieces and publish them. Oh. Yeah, I think I want to begin by noting that these pieces come from deep wrestling. When you have family members from Puerto Rico who assimilate because if they don't, they don't think they can make it financially. They are, in fact, not sure they can live. Mm -hmm. You appreciate, and maybe that's not the right word, but you understand mm -hmm. why, for example, my abuelo often will tell you his name is George, even though his name is Jorge. Mm -hmm. He's not sure it's safe to share that with you. Mm -hmm. My abuela will tell you her name is Martha, though her name is Marta. And if both of my abuelos are here, then they will say, oh, I'm George and Martha, like the first president and the first lady, mm -hmm. because they're trying to highlight that they're American, because they think that if they don't, it might not be safe. Why would they think that? Because they have been on the other side. They have been a Latino or Latina in much worse than the parish house. And when I think about my, my dad and some of the reasons he didn't set it as a goal to teach my siblings and I Spanish, I know that's a complicated thing. Mm. And I have forgiven my father, and uh, he has forgiven me for inordinate anger that I had about this. Uh, but the truth is there are jokes that my dad and I can never share because I don't understand Spanish well enough. Mm. There are aspects of my, of my family down in Puerto Rico that that I, that I can't get. Again, especially these jokes. That's how jokes work. They're always these special senses of, of words. <laughs> I don't understand them. And there have been several times when I was speaking Spanish um, with family members uh, down in Puerto Rico, and I was, I was rejected. <laughs> I was rejected as one who didn't speak well enough, that had too much of an Anglo accent, et cetera. Uh, and then I, I think in particular, too, about the deep wrestling that came with Mama. Hmm. I love my Mama's deceased. She died a few years ago. There are few people I could ever love more. Hmm. There are few people that have ever loved me more. But we always had racism between us. She was born and raised in the Jim and Jane Crow south of South Carolina. And I remember, I remember one time she was staying with us. She called me into to the room. And uh, hold on, I gotta figure out where I put the tissues. This is the problem, all right, I got, got it. So she, uh, she, calls, she calls me into her room and she starts trying to explain to me why I shouldn't have black friends. Oh. Because don't you know that there's a curse on Ham's descendants, and don't you know that God doesn't want people of different races to mingle? This is what we see in the Mosaic Covenant. Mm. And I was so undone, because here is a woman who I know is empowered by the Spirit, is one of the most godly people I've ever met, and she is devastating me with racist lies that she was taught. And I knew that despite how much she loved me, despite how much I loved her, there was a tremendous barrier we were going to have to work through. And I hated it. Mm. It took 20 years, friends, 20 years for Mama to go from suggesting that I shouldn't have black friends to telling me that my best friend, Lawrence Anglin, who's African-American and Jamaican, very dark-skinned, very, very dark-skinned brother, but that Lawrence, she saw as a son. Mm. It's 20 years of pain, 20 years of wrestling. And I think one of the reasons that these pieces are hard to deal with is that it brings up 
not just one episode or another, but 20 years of pain, mm. 20 years of not feeling like you belong in any part of your family, having every part of your family question your belonging and, and, and still loving you mm. in certain respects, not, not, not as well as they should have, but, but in certain respects. And the last thing I'll mention is this, because um, I, I think you're right about uh, highlighting how the church is, is not only complicit in evils, but is perpetuating these things. I will tell you that it was not until I was in college that I heard a sermon that had anything to do with identity besides flimsy notions of identity in Christ <laughs> that often were weaponized as ways of getting you to assimilate into some version of whiteness. 100%. So I, I think of my mamma's horrific discipleship. I think of my emaciated discipleship. I think about how my parents were not equipped. Nobody came to them and said, you know, part of your responsibility as a parent of multiracialized children is to understand racialized issues in the United States because your, your kids are catching hell mm -hmm. every single day. You got authority figures, whether pastors or priests or teachers that are telling you, telling your kids they don't belong. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to work through this. And my, my parents were not equipped for that. Mm -hmm. Now, they, they are much better now than, than when I was going through it, but those were hard lessons for them. Mm -hmm. And it's taken a lot of conversation, a lot of repenting. And by repenting, I don't just mean mere apologizing. I mean really turning away from evil and embracing good. So those are some of the things that are coming to mind as I think about our time in this space. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you sharing that. I want to pause and let everyone know if you're not familiar already with the Slido that I mentioned before. We are looking forward to entertaining your thoughts and your questions throughout our time for the rest of the evening. I wanna let you know that if you're familiar with Slido, you can go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O dot C-O-M. And the event number is 86706. The event number is 86706 with slido.com. I appreciate you sharing not only authentically, Dr. Cartagena, but I also appreciate you leaning into agency. Mm. Agency is a theme that I see in both of your pieces, as short as they are, of you learning about your sense of being an agent, mm. of having some sense of personhood or self, and also some sense of power. I think about the power that you had, the depth of responsibility that you had with your amigos, as you mm -hmm. talked about in the parish house, and all the weight that sat on your shoulders. Yeah. You talked about how your pace, your words, whether or not you could share what you were feeling or couldn't share what you were feeling, how that would impact mm. the people around you. And I'm curious if you would speak to agency for college students. Oh, yeah. You would take your moment of thinking about your own racial identity development, your own thoughts about agency. Yeah. You would talk to our students here about what it means for them not to be passive students. Yeah. The, the person that's coming to mind at the moment is Charles Lawrence III. And the reason is uh, he's a law professor who's written extensively on race and racism. Charles Lawrence III stresses the need to be people of the word. And by that, he means people who are actively reading and listening so that they can improve and increase their understanding of the world that they inhabit. Mm -hmm. But also, he thinks if you're a person of the word, to hear in certain senses is to then go on and act and in some ways obey, meaning the realities of the world are shaping you so that you say, oh, here are the issues, here are the people that need mercy, here are the forms of injustice, okay, now I need to go. And I think the Christian life is supposed to be something very much like that, where mm -hmm. we're not just mere hearers of the word, but we're also doers of the word, to mm -hmm. use James's language. And as I think about my own time, I found that reading ended up being something that I moved from hating. <laughs> my mom couldn't even get me to read wishbone books and things like that, because like, no, 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 I don't want to read it all. Let's just go play outside. And then I realized I was never going to be a sports star, and I was like, oh, crud, what am I going to do? <laughs> Too short, not fast enough, all sorts of things like that. <laughs> but I, I slowly started to get into reading so that I could understand my world. And I didn't know that there were books or articles that were about race and racialization and colonialism and what it means to be a Latino or Latina in the United States. And suddenly I, I found these when I was later on in my undergrad. And I went, whoa, 
this is amazing. <laughs> and I realized that part of what I needed to do was increase my understanding so that I could discern what it would be to be a, a, a follower of Christ, growing in sanctification in this racialized world that was promoting justice and mercy hmm. within the context of all these racialization practices. So what's it like to, to see Mama as one that's so saturated by Jim and Jane Crow white supremacy and to be merciful to her? Hmm. What's it like to promote just learning habits for Miha, my daughter, so that she knows that she's Latina, but that's not all she is. Mm -hmm. We're gonna celebrate the fact that, that mommy's got all these amazing Anglo traits. And okay, what is it gonna mean for you, Anna, who's lighter skinned with lighter hair? What's it gonna mean for you to embrace these gifts? And not, as, as uh, Gloria Anzaldúa would say, cop out, mm. to take all of your, your heritage seriously. So I would stress that at this time when you're in school, it's important to be learning. But as you're learning, think about the ways in which the things you're learning are gonna help you to be a better neighbor to be one that better loves God in the context of your particular communities. So I'll, give, I'll just give one example. If you are learning more and more about racialized uh, issues, and then you, uh, you, let's say you learn about Hispanic Heritage Month. Well, one of the things you can decide you're gonna do that month is you're gonna learn more about Latino and Latina experiences in the United States. Mm -hmm. And then you might learn, for example, that, uh, that those that were Mexicanos and Mexicanas, they end up being deemed legally white because of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in mm -hmm. 1848. Since at that time, to be a U.S. citizen, you had to be a white person, and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo made it so that these people could be white, boom. Now they're, well, they're white by legal fiat. <laughs> but most people aren't seeing them that way. But now here comes the question. How are these people going to relate to this notion of whiteness, mm -hmm. to the potential of that new identity? How did that shape the way that they were passing on things? What, did they, what were they willing to jettison so that they could get the privileges and the access and the power and so forth that would come with this new identity? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, as, you, as you think about those things, then you can ask, okay, well, what was that like for other immigrants? Uh, so of course, the Mexicanos, Mexicanos weren't immigrants, but what was it like if you were an immigrant from Southeastern Europe and you're coming here? What were the things that were dangled in front of you that people said, okay, assimilate, and you can have, as it were, the kingdoms? Hmm. What did you have to give up? And then as you look around and you think about the Latinos and Latinas you're experiencing, you can ask, okay, how are they experiencing similar things? What are the forms of assimilation that are set before them? What are the, as it were, the, 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 the idols? that people are setting before them, and, and how, has, how has their family responses shaped their response, and how are, they, how are they dealing with being in places that are racialized differently, mm. uh, to have their identity change so much, because that's often something that happens with racialized uh, practices. You're identified one way in one setting, and then another way in another setting. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of these can be things that you're learning about during, say, Hispanic Heritage Month, and then when you're trying to interact with your neighbors, you can ask more informed questions, you can pray better for them. Uh, you can go into your churches and say, okay, look, if we're gonna love our Latino and Latina sisters and brothers, we have gotta be thinking about things that are going on in the border, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of learning that can then lead to deeper, more informed action. Mm. That's really helpful to hear. Um, one of the things I hear you sharing is the significance of, of, of standing in tension. Yeah. of acknowledging the tension of your own literal embodied existence as a mestizo, as you often talk about. Yeah. Also acknowledging the tension between the cultural groups that you represent, standing between them, standing between racist or white supremacist or any variation of any of those yeah. ways of understanding the world and the reality of the kingdom that we're called to, yeah. that we are called to pray and bring in, to usher in. And also I hear a theme of questions of the significance of being willing to ask questions yes. and to wrestle with questions, to try and answer questions that can be answered and to acknowledge when sometimes questions can't be answered quite the way we want or as quickly as we want and to sit with that. Mm. And I'd like to use that as a segue to some of the questions that we have please, here. Please, Hermana, yes. Some students are um, finding several questions really especially helpful. I'm gonna start actually with this one. This question is from an anonymous source that asks, what is something you find great pride in as a part of Latina Latino diaspora? Oh, one of the things that I've been proud of is what we call abuelita theology. So what do you learn from your abuela? And in my case, uh, one of the things I learned from my abuela and my mama mm. is the, the centrality of mercy in the kingdom of God the centrality of mercy in the kingdom of God. Mm. And they would stress that in Matthew, uh, 
and the beginning of Matthew and Matthew 5, blessed are the merciful for they will be, they will receive mercy. Uh, in Matthew 7, Jesus says, be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. Matthew 25, uh, for the, those that are separated into goats and to sheep are separated in terms of who is doing these good deeds for the least of these. That's right. Because insofar as you do them for the least of these, you've also done them unto me. Mm. And this has been important because for, for uh, my abuela, she is, in certain senses, a kind of immigrant. It's, it's a really wonky thing when you're coming from Puerto Rico into what they call the mainland. That's how they think of the contiguous United States. Mm -hmm. um, so what's it like to, in some senses, leave your home, go into another home? It's very different sets of cultural experiences and languages. Uh, my abuelo was in the military. He was in the Air Force. So they traveled all over the United States, had really different experiences about mm -hmm. what it meant to be Puerto Rican in any of those places. Mm -hmm. But everywhere they went, my, ma my, my abuela said, we have to make sure that we are caring for widows and orphans mm. because these are the good works that the Lord is calling us to. And they didn't see that you are saved by your good works. They thought, no, 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 the more you love the Lord, mm -hmm. the more you're going to love your neighbors, the more you're going to do these good works. Mm. And similar things with my mama. Uh, my mama was horrifically abused as a child, mm. and she, um, she was familiar with how much the church failed to care for abuse victims, for the mm. oppressed, for the exploited and so she stressed to me that I better take care of the abused, of the oppressed, of the exploited. Mm. And so one of the things, again, I'm going to use the broader Latino Latina category of Walita theology. So the theology, that in part, you learn from your, from your, your abuelos, your, your abuela, uh, in this case, my mama too, is an emphasis on mercy as one of the outworkings that comes when the spirit is at work in you. That's right. and, I, and I'll say the last thing is that that has really shaped my approach to discussing race and racism at Wheaton's campus. Mm. Because I think that the truth is, whether you are a racialized minority or a racialized majority student, you are in a racialized world that's very much like Plato's Cave, <laughs> book seven of the Republic. It is just a quagmire. And it's very easy not to understand that that's what you're, you're in because you're like, well, there's some light behind us. And no, 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 hold on. It's way worse than you think. Mm -hmm. So everybody is growing in the understanding of the world they've been thrown into. Mm -hmm. And as they're, as they're thrown into that, they need merciful teachers, those who will see the different ways in which they're suffering from ignorance, they're suffering from the forms of, uh, of racism and discrimination that are coming against them. And I think about uh, my abuela and my, and my mama saying, the king is asking you to be amongst those that are suffering. That's right. Go and teach. That's right. I love that you are thinking about what you've learned from both of your grandmothers and the distinctiveness of each of their cultures and yeah. the ways that their distinct cultures have shaped your unique expression of those cultures together. Mm. One of the questions that we have here asks, would you say that your being racialized as black has contributed to your passion for race? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> can you say more? So, yes, this is a great question. Uh, as you can tell, I'm real light-skinned, right? I'm, I mean, I'm probably lighter than Homie, Homer Plessy, who, who the Supreme Court said was, he is, he's so light, we wouldn't even think he was black. <laughs> and then you still get Plessy v. Ferguson because they're like, well, he's got an eighth of African blood. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he, he can't sit with the white people. Mm -hmm. So I'll say this. There, um, there's something distinctively challenging about being a member of a diaspora people when you don't know some of that language. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, well, how do you find community where people understand what it's like to be, in some sense, part of the diaspora, uh, to be part of a diaspora people, but they're still reaching out, they're still showing mercy. And when I learned that through my experiences, through reflecting on what Thomas said, that the people were racializing me as black, again, a lot of things clicked. I thought about how many times people used the N-word at me, mm -hmm. the ways in which I felt most comfortable, in particular with African Americans. There, I, I was also comfortable with Afro-Caribbean people, but the African Americans, they lent themselves more to being with Puerto Ricans, to wanting to hear what you have to say, than some of the people that, uh, that were part of the uh, African Caribbean, uh, different forms of the, the diaspora there. And there were tensions between the African Americans, the Afro Caribbean uh, peoples. Mm -hmm. But when I saw myself being racialized as black, I quickly learned that racialization couldn't just track phenotypic traits. Mm -hmm. And I learned that cultures get racialized, language gets racialized, behavior gets racialized. Mm -hmm. In a way that if you are darker skinned, for example, if you're, if you're more black and more brown, you might not get to learn that. Mm -hmm. Because wherever you're going, there's gonna be certain forms of racialization patterns that are more likely to follow you. But I was, uh, as we'd say in Spanish, a blanquito, so, so this like little white boy. <laughs> and, and all these people are racializing me in black. I'm going, what is, what is this? 
But if I, when I understood that that's how they were racializing me, there was a form of liberation that came. I was like, oh, I can live into this and, and I can expect certain behavior in light of this racialization pattern. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. But the problem is, then you go somewhere else and the patterns are different. Correct. So one of the things I found in Wheaton <laughs> is that uh, not everybody's expecting I'm saying I'm gonna be racialized black. Mm -hmm. And, and, and some of them are kind of like, how are you such good friends with Dr. Theon Hill? Now, Lord knows that he, he is. He's not always the easiest to be friends with. No, I'm just kidding. That brother's good. <laughs> that brother's good. He, he, he's been kind to me, even made me mac and cheese. I mean, mac and cheese. Come on now. <laughs> but notice how even as I'm talking, as I start to reminisce on some of these relationships, my tone changes, the words I'm going to use change. Mm -hmm. This is part of that multicultural, multiracialized experience. I'm very at home with Ebonics. Mm -hmm. I'm very at home with jazz and the blues. Oh, man, Toni Morrison, you know? <laughs> in fact, last thought on this, I find that I have to enter into Latino, Latina issues obliquely. Hmm. So being racialized black made it so that a lot of the components of African-American literature resonated, mm -hmm. but not all of them. Mm -hmm. There were always going to be these impediments to my, as it were, really feeling like, ah, oh, you're speaking to me. Mm -hmm. But if I only went to Latino and Latina sources, where no, none of these people have been racialized as black. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, no, what, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. So I found that I, I had to be able to go in and out of various traditions. And the last thing I'll say about that is, um, when you're in broader evangelical spaces as I, as I was in, you also get enculturated into forms of racialized whiteness. Mm -hmm. and, and they're different in different locations. I understand that. Uh, what it was in South Carolina was not the same thing as New Jersey. But I know how to speak what you might call racialized white evangelicalism. <laughs> Definitely I, I'm language. very adept at that. And in part, I had to be because of the schools that I went to. But I can go in and out of that, in and out of certain forms of African American culture, in and out of certain forms of, of broader Latino Latino culture, especially if they're if they're connected to Puerto Rico. Uh, but yeah, th these are all blessings and curses because as much as you end up having some agency and fluency in these different settings you also don't ever feel like you belong to any of them fully. Mm -hmm. And that hurts mm -hmm. because I, I, there's a certain respect in which I'm going to feel at home in a historically black church. Mm -hmm. And then in other respects, we're not at all. Mm -hmm. And I know that when they see me walk through the door, their first thought is not, oh, yeah, here's a Puerto Rican that was racialized black in New Jersey. Let's go. <laughs> nope. <laughs> what are you doing in here? Mm -hmm. And it's probably not the best idea for me to lead off. You know, I love Baldwin. I love Angela Davis. Appropriation. Is this what's going on? I mean, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> so I hope that gives some, some, some uh, range of answers to that good question. That definitely is a range of answers, and I appreciate the range. Um, I think with the first time you told me that you were racialized as black, and I remember sitting there being like, <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Like, I really, actually, I stopped speaking. I don't know what you were saying. I'll let him keep, let him keep going while I try to figure out, what did you just say? Yeah, oh yeah. And it was very significant to me to be able to have the, the freedom and the privilege to be able to hear you share more of your story, of your experience of being yeah. racialized, mm -hmm. of saying that this wasn't something that you were like, hey, I'm black. I, yeah, I watch right. people. I've seen people like decide to be black. I'm like, I just, I don't think you can just make that decision. That's just not how that goes. <laughs> and I, right. I, it was significant to me to hear you talk about what your right. life and experiences have been. And it reminded me of the diversity of this nation. Yeah diversity of the, the, the range of experiences that happen if you grow up down south or if you grow up on the west coast versus the east coast versus the midwest versus any other region of the country and what it looks like for you to belong in one space like you described and, and not to belong in other uh -huh. spaces and what it means for other people to project their perceptions onto you and for you to think about what, what can I accept and take in? Yeah. What do I want to accept and take in, but maybe I can't, this point of tension, this point of uh, impediment, like you talked about a moment ago. Yeah. And what, what can I say, this does resonate with my story, whether or not it's because of my ethnic identity or not. Yeah. And um, I also know a question I have, I know that many people, even if they're not coming from a racialized minority group or they're not mestizo or they're not coming from this mixed heritage, yeah. they also struggle with kind of identifying with their own people. Mm. This happens a lot on Wheaton's campus for white students in particular. Yeah. Of not wanting to identify as white or not wanting to be a certain type of white. Yeah. And I'm curious if you would speak to our students in general and maybe to our white brothers and sisters specifically about not coming from a mixed heritage in terms of race, but saying I'm struggling with this yeah. background, this culture, this heritage. What would you say to them? Oh, I think one of the most important things to start with is asking, what is this Professor Cartagena doing talking about racialized? <laughs> I've heard that phrase over and over again. 
So here now I put on, now I go into race scholar mode for a moment. Do it. It's important to realize that there are no biological races. There's nothing like an atomic number that serves as an essence for anybody racialized black, white, yellow, brown, etc. Mm -hmm. Which means that what you get throughout history are different racialization patterns of different groups. Sometimes you're racialized black because of phenotype. Sometimes you're racialized black because of the one drop rule. Sometimes you're racialized white if you're Chinese. Sometimes you're racialized yellow. Sometimes you're Irish, you're racialized black. Sometimes you're racialized white. So whiteness is this fluid concept that's changing throughout history. And the Iberian Peninsula, if you're thinking about Spain and Portugal, they racialize white in one way. The Anglos coming out of, of England racialize it another way. So for example, for my ancestors, uh, I have Portuguese and Spanish ancestors. Uh, they were thinking about whiteness in terms of speaking Spanish or Portuguese, mm -hmm. in terms of being Roman Catholic. My mom's side, they're thinking about whiteness in terms of your connection to England and your ability to be Protestant and your, 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 your capacities with English. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, there are other versions uh, of whiteness. And I, I think it's important to, 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 to tap into this, important, to this question, okay, so if whiteness isn't this biologically real thing, if it's a social construct that's gonna have social and political significance of extreme order, because remember, in the United States in 1790, the very first Naturalization Act, the very first immigration law, declares that only white people of good character that have been living in the United States for two years can become citizens. Hmm. So here's the key question. Well, who gets to count as white? Mm -hmm. And the United States wrestles with answering that question all the way until the whiteness clause drops in 53, 1953. <laughs> That's a long time. But one of the good questions people are asking is, well, again, who, who's going to count as white? So as I mentioned, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, you got all these Mexicanos, Mexicanas. Well, in some sense, you're white, but in other senses, you're not. Mm. You have Irish coming, and because of, in particular, the, the, the serious... Um, disdain that the Irish and the English have for one another. Irish are coming over and they're gonna be seen as, as black, not gonna be seen as white. But once certain aspects of phenotypic difference get emphasized, there are ways in which you can move in to whiteness. So I'm saying all this in part because I think one of the deepest questions anybody has to interrogate about whiteness is, okay, when did any of my family members start thinking that they were white? Mm. It's a deep question. And I remember talking to my mom about this. I said, okay, mom, we're, I know it's gonna be hard, but I need to tell you that you're not white. <laughs> She's like, what? That makes no sense, of course I'm white. Just look at me, no, no, no. I, I said, I really want, I want to have a conversation about race as a social construct. And my mom struggled deeply because she had a profound sense of white race consciousness. Mm. A profound sense. And it was very hard for her to wrestle with the ways in which that was a contingent thing. Hmm. And we got into good questions about uh, the ways in which, in particular, forms of whiteness had operated in her family so that certain people were seen as white but better, and others were seen as white and white trash. Mm -hmm. We got into discussions about how that tracked language, how that tracked regions, how that tracked family histories, et cetera. But one of the things we also found is that across her family, people were trying to move into those forms of whiteness mm -hmm. that were more and more connected with economic success, success, more and more connected with privilege and ability and access to a whole range of things. And so we had to ask hard questions about what did our family give up so that they could have this identity? And again, mm -hmm. this, this profound question, when did they start seeing themselves as white? Now, I know for some of us, the way I'm answering this question is going to sound a bit crazy. But it's no, in certain sense, it's no crazier than, than me saying I was racialized as black and trying to live into this, right? We have to ask ourselves, what is it like to recognize that we're in a racialized world, but racialized categories are always on the move. Mm -hmm. And because they're always on the move, we actually have to take stock of the ways in which we are racializing, and here's the key, ourselves. How do we see ourselves? And then how do others see us? Mm -hmm. And where are there times where there's overlap and then where there's times that there's disconnect? Mm -hmm. And one more thing on this. It's one thing to know that you're gonna be racialized as white when you go into a certain sphere. It's a whole nother thing to ask, what are the things that people for historic reasons associate with whiteness? Mm -hmm. And what are those things? 
that I find that are good about those associations and what are those things that I find are negative about those associations. And it's gonna vary from region to region, but that's gonna be an important thing because as you inhabit the world, you're inhabiting a racialized world where people are going to be racializing you if you're racialized white according to certain visions of what they think whiteness brings. And for you to love your neighbors well, you have to get to a point where you can understand, oh, okay, they're gonna see me as white. They're probably gonna associate whiteness with these sorts of things. Now, what are the ways in which I can A, understand that, and then B, navigate it so I can, I might say, yeah, these are some of the things that I accept, but these are some of the things I reject, and how now can we interact in a way that enables me to communicate that? Yeah. I think a question that I'm sitting with, and I mindfully have a few more moments before we pause, I'm sitting with the social reality yeah. of whiteness and also your comments about what we get to take in and what we choose to kind of put aside. And I'm curious, I'm curious how you navigate that space, though whiteness is a fluid concept. Yeah. Whiteness is dynamic and always on the move as you're describing. It is also real. I'm curious for those who think mm -hmm. about some people who live in a different reality. And as a psychologist, I think about this quite a bit, those who live in a delusion. Those live in an alternate universe, and sometimes they come out of the delusion, so they realize that's where they've been, and other times they don't. And that's, I'm thinking about like psychosis. Yeah. I'm also thinking about those who don't struggle with psychosis officially, but are also living in a delusion. And that any of us could be susceptible to that, so I don't say that with judgment or contempt. Yeah. But I think about the reality of whiteness on Wheaton's campus, in the church. And I'm curious, even as we work to overturn the problematic aspects of whiteness, how you make sense of its reality in lived experience as well. Yeah, so for me, this is a profoundly historical question, and it's bound up with uh, a question of how have people conceived of whiteness in these different regions? How do they pass laws in terms of whiteness? How is it that they're going to uh, construct neighborhoods for white people and then neighborhoods for those they deem non-white? Mm -hmm. so, so visions, this is so important, the vision of somebody as white or non-white, then with all these ideas, all these ideologies that are connected to these racialization patterns, they then go to have a massive, play a massive role in the ways in which individuals act and shape the world. Mm -hmm. So you can't understand, for example, Chicago or a place like Wheaton mm -hmm. or Glen Ellen if you don't understand redlining practices. Mm -hmm. So there's an intentional designing of this region so that certain places are for whites right. and certain places are for non-whites. Certain money goes to places for whites. Only certain other kinds of money goes for places to non-whites. And it doesn't matter how you, in any particular moment, identify. That's right. The reality is that people understood race in certain ways. The ideologies then shape the kinds of worlds they're trying to shape. And then the world becomes shaped by that. Mm -hmm. So that... Uh, again, a place like a, a place like Southside Chicago is intentionally designed to be a kind of hellhole mm -hmm. for racialized not for those that are not racialized as white. Whereas Northern Sh North Side Chicago, mm -hmm. that's supposed to be a place for racialized whites. Mm -hmm. And there are places like that all throughout the United States. And, and I, I stress this because it's important to see that throughout much of its history, the United States was a racial apartheid. Mm -hmm. So if you even think about indigenous brothers and sisters. Um, one of the reasons that the uh, colonists are, are willing to go to war with England is they want the land that's on the west of, the, uh, of Appalachia. Mm -hmm. and, and they got the 1763 proclamation from, from, from the king who says, no, you can't go over there. And like, oh, yeah, we got land surveyors. We're going to get us some of that good old land. <laughs> but notice, once, they be, once you get the U.S., there's initially a land. It's like, okay, that's where the indigenous live. We live over here. Mm -hmm. It's a form of segregation. Then you're going to get genocide, you're going to get land stealing, you're going to get expatriation, all this sorts of stuff. But what you keep getting then is this sequestering of non-whiteness into certain zones. And this is just the historic reality and this vision of an expansion of the white nation. Mm -hmm. And this is what colonial scholars would talk about when they're talking about pigmentocracies. So it has nothing to do with whether, yeah, it has to do with the conceptions of people seeing themselves as white and trying to create governments and countries for and by white people. Mm -hmm. So that you can have the Indian Removal Act of 1830, and it's, it's this mass exit, force exodus of indigenous peoples from the south and places like Georgia to this place that nobody wants to live in in Oklahoma. Mm. That gets to be what they'll call Indian country, and all this other area is now going to be prime place for plantations. Mm. But
But even in the plantation setup, okay, racialized whites are living here, racialized blacks are living here. So that's how they're constructing the world. Mm -hmm. So the, one of the profound questions to ask is, not just like, how am I identifying? Mm -hmm. that, 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 yes, that's, that, that matters, but a key question is, how are other people identifying you? How are they identifying groups? And then how are they forming the world along the lines of these different uh, forms of racialization? So that la last thought on this. Um, yeah, you have, you have political parties saying, we try to become the white man's party. Mm. And they're open about it, mm -hmm. yep. We're trying to be the sort of party where people that see themselves as white and as male are more likely to vote for us than those who don't. Mm -hmm. This is what we're trying to do. So in some sense, it doesn't matter if whiteness isn't real. <laughs> if they're projecting a certain vision of whiteness and you're one that's also projecting that and you're like, yeah, no, this is who I think I am. These are how I see myself. They're trying to woo you to vote for them and mm -hmm. to see their party as your party. This is, this is a historic reality. So you get not only the shaping of lands, but you get the shaping of political parties, you get the shaping of policies, so no doubt about it. Yeah. But you can always call it into question when you're seeing that, okay, these are social constructions. These are things that are historically contingent. It didn't have to be this way. Mm -hmm. Why was it this way? Mm -hmm. And how can we resist and remediate it? Yeah. I hope, uh, yeah, I hope, because this is a great question. I hope that gives some resources. Yeah, I think you have. I think you've named so many things that people weren't taking notes. I hope you go back and watch the recording. It was a crash course history lesson, just in case you missed it, on many aspects of our American history that are not discussed that yeah. you often talk about in our conversations. And I'll make this a preface to my last question. You often talk, Dr. Cartagena, about this collective amnesia, this organized oh, yeah. forgetting yeah. that we engage in as a society. And, and I... I'm drawn to that way of thinking about things because of how repulsive it is, actually. To think about an organized way of forgetting about the types of things that you've mentioned. Because what you've described is something that is incredibly controversial, known as systemic racism. Yep. This is a system of people, different people at different times, choosing, sometimes consciously, sometimes subconsciously, Nevertheless, choosing to create a reality that we all live in. Yeah. And it's easier to ignore that and deny that. And I think about how easy that is for us when we become overwhelmed to say, good, I've got about two and a half more minutes and I can forget about this and go do my homework. Or I can go grade papers or I can go do something else. I made an invitation at the beginning of our time for us to be present here. I want to make another invitation to us to remain present with what we've taken in not to allow it to leave us and not for us to leave it. The reality that Dr. Cartagena has been describing that is often not discussed. Like reality that he's described as complex, yeah. as frustrating, it's angering. I've noticed the number of times as I've been sitting here this last hour and 12 minutes, I wanna be like, ah, oh, no, that can't be right. <laughs> and that's not just you saying I was racialized as black. That's right. There's other things that you said where I'm like, ooh, I don't, I don't like that. Yeah. And I think about what does it mean for me to internalize a, a racist way of thinking even so that I shun away from or shy away from realities I need to be able to see, yeah. to be able to speak the truth, which is what we're called to as believers, to tr speak the truth in love and to acknowledge that love has a more expansive definition than we might prefer, that it involves the truth and the truth that is painful. As you talk about this systemic reality, I want to close with the most popular question on our Slido here, okay. which has to do with Wheaton College. Ooh. And this is always, I think, a question in many of our minds of where we are, what does this mean for me? And, and part of my own resistance, actually, to this question is I think it's easy to jump to a solution. Hmm. I'm like, well, Kristen, it's still the most popular question, so you need to ask it. It's a really good <laughs> question that many people have liked, and so I will ask it. I'm curious, as we think about this systemic racism that we live in in the U.S., yeah. we think about the land even that we sit on here that you've talked about already is the yes. stolen land. That's a context for this question that many people are grateful has been written. And the question asks, what can Wheaton College do better to truly become a multiracial, multicultural, kingdom-reflecting community? Ooh, y'all are asking good questions on a Monday night. Let's start with that first off. Amen, amen. Oh. Well, I've noticed that sometimes we don't ever mention that this was a school founded by an abolitionist who was all about a kind of radical education, nor did we recognize that though Jonathan 
Brother Jonathan Blanchard was an abolitionist, he was also still racist in certain senses. He was not going to be for the kind of marriage that I have. Mm. Multiracialized marriage, no, no. And then there's this jump, if we ever do talk about <laughs> the abolitionist founding. And, and some want to talk about it just to flash it out, like, yeah, look at that. Then you say, okay, how would we do, how did we do for the next 80 years? Good question. Oh, my. Let's be honest. What? Naperville was a red line, it was not a red line, excuse me, it was a sundown town. Hmm. Well, explain that. What is a sundown town? For sundown those who don't know? Oh, you see, this, thank you, sister. Thank you for making okay. sure I've I, I got to stay pedagogical. So, a sundown town is a town where racialized blacks almost, for the most part, sometimes it extends to other racialized minority groups, but they are legally not allowed out of their homes once the sun is down. And if you are out, you can be arrested mm -hmm. and much worse. So, Naperville is a sundown town. Now, it changes from being a sundown town in part because they want to expand the commercial uh, aspects. They want to bring in more money. And so if you want to bring in more money and you want to have more cheap labor, okay, you're going to have to change the makeup. But one of the questions to ask is, what were people, for example, at Wheaton doing in response to that form of systemic racism, that form of legalized racism, so that quite literally certain bodies can only be, certain racialized bodies can only be outside at certain times? Hmm. The answer is not much. That's the sad truth, not much. Mm -hmm. And then you ask about the hiring, so this, now we're going to go even deeper. You ask about, well, what were the hiring practices of Wheaton? What are the visions of Christian education that mm -hmm. Wheaton sees itself as a part of? So one of the things that drives me crazy is when I hear people talk about Christian education and they never mention historically black colleges and universities, mm -hmm. most of which identify as Christian, mm -hmm. most of which are not part of the CCCU. Crazy. And, and, and the CCCU acts like <laughs> they're the only, not everybody, I, I know, I know, but... Most people in the CCU don't even know about historical black colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm noting this because you get not only questions about, well, who's interacting with whom for how long, mm -hmm. but there are also questions about, well, what kind of metrics are we using? So how many people, for example, could t that are teaching at Wheaton could go and teach at Hampton University? Mm -hmm. And how many people that are teaching at Hampton could come and teach at Wheaton? Mm -hmm. And they're going to be Christians. I mean, goodness, they're all about the Trinity, two natures of Christ. We can go on and on and on. But you have to ask, well, wait a second, what are these racialized, cultural, linguistic barriers that would come that would impede the kind of life that we have together? And then, I, 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 you know, as, as I think about that, I think, okay, historically, black colleges and universities are designed to be a certain kind of school. But a lot of the CCCU schools are not designed to be that. Hmm. They're not, as, as I remember talking to one of my good colleagues in the philosophy department, he said, you know, even, even 20 years ago, they pr we probably wouldn't have hired you hmm. because they weren't hiring Latinos. And even if we say it's not because they weren't actively against Latinos, mm -hmm. you have to ask, well, what were the visions of hireable people? Mm -hmm. What were the visions of what it meant to be a follower of Christ that were shaping the kind of hiring practices that people had? Mm -hmm. So I think that one of the things you're seeing at Wheaton is an effort by many to reckon with the ways in which there's this long history of Christian higher education in the United States that's going to have all sorts of forms of rights, white supremacy, sexism, mm -hmm. flowing through, pulsating through, and asking, okay, if we want to resist that, if we want to change that, well, what does it look like? Mm -hmm. And yes, this will in include bringing different students, different faculty, different administrators, different staff, but we also got to make sure we don't go what I call the Crayola crayon box <laughs> approach. Because sometimes what this is like, let's have a zoo. <laughs> one of you, and one of you, and one of you, yes. one of you. But then the question, remember, if, if race is a fluid concept, the question you have to ask is, well, what, what racialization patterns are we using? That's right. Are we just going by phenotypic difference? Because if you're just doing that, I'll tell you what our, what our good brothers and sisters in, in, in uh, the country of India would say. There are some people who look like coconuts, and that's what they are. They're brown on the outside and white on the inside. And you go, ooh. And some of our Asian brothers and sisters would be like, yeah, we call that a banana. Yellow on the outside, white on the inside. And you're going, what in the world is all this? And what they're getting at are the ways in which there are certain patterns of thinking that historically have been connected to certain racialization schemes. And you can, you can, <laughs> you can tell when certain people are performing, in a sense, different racialization schemes. So one of the questions we'd have to ask is not only is a person in a certain sense racialized, let's say is black in terms of phenotypes, uh, but is it the case that, that she or he is also one that is bringing in, in a proud way uh, 
the wholeness of their particular racialized black community mm. and saying, this is what it means for us to be Christians. Here's the ways that God is working in our community. Mm. And you all need that. Mm. But we also need what the Lord's been doing in your community. Mm. So now we have mutual reciprocity rather than forms of assimilation. Hmm. We have mutual edification rather than assimilation. We have a recognition that the spirit of God is at work in different communities and, and importantly different ways, all to the glory of God, all to the praise of the son, but still different. Yeah. And we're in desperate need of one another. So we, we need to be able to listen to our poor white brothers and sisters and say, talk to us about what it is to be exploited. Hmm. Because you are not a professional, you're blue collar. What is it mm -hmm. to be seen as still never making it? Mm -hmm. But then we go to our Latina sister and we say, what is it to deal with those distinctive forms of sexual racism mm -hmm. where everybody thinks that you are sexually promiscuous? We go to our black sisters and we say, what is it to deal with those racist tropes? We go to our black male friends and we say, what is it to deal with your racist tropes, the Latinos, et cetera, et cetera. We go to indigenous communities and we say, what is it to still claim Christ amidst all this genocide? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? How do you still believe in the goodness of our triune God in spite of all of this? So much to learn. Mm. And I think that this is one of the great things that comes with being at Wheaton. And this is how I want to close. Wheaton at its best emphasizes being for the kingdom of God, mm. which is this multi-racialized host of peoples, all united to Christ by the power of the spirit because of the will of the father and all of which are making important, unique contributions, and we need the insights, the gifts of all these saints so that the vision at Wheaton can, can be one where we more and more live into the question of what mutual reciprocity looks like. What does it look like for me to benefit from you and from you to benefit from me, to me to learn from you, for you to learn from me, mm. expecting the Spirit has equipped each of us to be able to edify the other. Mm. And again, what you're not hearing me say is anybody's going to have the market on truth. Anybody's going to have the market on exactly how every aspect of the jot and tittle of Christian theology is going to go. It's, it's going to be complicated. We'll have things to learn from one another. And again, I think when Wheaton is at its best, it's doing that. I think when Wheaton has been at some of its worst, there have been ways in which Wheaton gets pushed into and sometimes people that are part of it will embrace forms of civic religion hmm. that are not the same thing as the kingdom of God. And every Christian community has to be careful about that. Hmm. Nationalism, and the forms of racialization that accompany that are always idols, and we got to go into the high places and take them down <laughs> and make sure that what we are lifting up is Christ and not certain visions of Christ that would elevate some peoples over others. Mm -hmm. That would say, for example, and, and this is a serious problem, and this is why I want to emphasize it a second time. I think there are, there are some who, who do not realize that the Lord is after both the oppressed and the oppressors. Mm -hmm. They don't have much room for Zacchaeus in their theology. Mm -hmm. But Zacchaeus is one who we see is saved when Zacchaeus says, I'm going to give back fourfold, which is more than what the Mosaic law requires. And I think that there are some who, when they get into certain discussions of oppressed or oppressor, or they're thinking about class and race dynamics, they're not, they're not asking the deeper questions about, okay, recognizing all this, how is the spirit still promoting belonging and unity? Mm. Now, unity is still going to presume the truth. We're going to have to have repentance. We're going to have to have reconciliation. We're not, we're not ignoring things. Mm -hmm. We're not going to pretend that it's been otherwise. But as we actually recognize the truth, as we live in light of the truth, what are we also doing? We're looking for that sweet mutual reciprocity. We're looking for the ways in which the spirit is edifying all of us. Mm. And again, I think when Wheaton is at its best, it's for Christ and Christ's kingdom. And it is a kingdom where all the saints get to glorify the Lord in the distinctive ways that the Lord is blessed to be able to do that. Mm. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Thank you, Dr. Cartagena. Dr. Yorda is going to come up and join us for our conclusion, but I want to say thank you on all of our behalf for this time. It's been a gift. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Ford, Dr. Cartagena, we are so grateful for your willingness to be here and to share um, with us today. I am thinking I have uh, five things that I'd just like to mention from the learning. Speaking with integrity is liberating. We can take all of our heritage seriously. Learning leads to deeper, more informed action. Abuelita theology the centrality of mercy, 
in the kingdom of God and be amongst those who are suffering. May we remain present with what we've taken in. Thank you to all of you for coming, for listening, for participating together tonight. Go in peace.